Welcome to the Making Up the Numbers podcast. The Making Up the Numbers podcast is sponsored by Hope Technology, Revolution Bike Park, Schwal, and the world's finest independent mountain bike magazine, Single Track. Hello and welcome to episode six of season two of the Making Up the Numbers podcast. I'm George Thompson and asking the questions with me once again tonight is SR Suntour One Vision's Jack Redding. How are we doing, Jack? I uh, think I saw yesterday that there may be some light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to World Cup racing. Have you heard anything? Yeah, I mean, there's chatter on the grapevine that we, we should at best expect a season from early September, maybe August onwards. So, yeah, I'm just working with my coach to kind of be as ready as possible for August and crossing our fingers for that. But I think everything's so up in the air, it could go either way at the moment. Cool. Well, yeah, that's just it's just um, play it by ear, really, isn't it? There's nothing else you can do. So once again, we're recording this episode via Zoom and the video will be available on the Single Track YouTube channel. And what a show we have for you tonight. Our special guests have been the dominant junior riders in World Cup downhill racing over the past couple of seasons. Bally Hall is the two-time junior women's world champion and the two-time junior women's world cup overall winner. And in 2018, she completed the perfect season, winning every round of the World Cup and World Championships in Lenza Hyde. Thibaut de Prella is the two-time junior men's world cup overall winner. In 2018, as a first-year junior, he was top three at every round of the World Cup winning five of those rounds. He also won a further five rounds in 2019 and amassed over double the number of points of Kaya Hearn in second place. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. Hello. That's an introduction, isn't it? <laughs> we really have got like the, the two best prospects in downhill, haven't we? Yeah. Here? Privileged to have you guys coming on. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. <laughs> Valley, let's start with you because your race stats are just absolutely mind-blowing. I went on Roots and Rain, which is what we use kind of for the research for this show. 56 races, 45 wins, never finished outside the top three, and you've only been third once. You've never had a flat or a mechanical, never crashed in a race run? I did. Uh, yeah. I actually crashed in, in Leogang in 2018 and uh, still won. That was uh, quite lucky. <laughs> and last year in Lenza I had a flat tire when I crossed the finish line. But I didn't recognize it when I was riding, so I was lucky. <laughs> That's okay. I believe you, you kind of started racing against boys and you won those races as well. Were those prompt one of the early, are those in the 56 that I've been talking about or was that prior to kind of the IXS stuff? No, I think it was like the IXS Rookies Cup. I think wow. it's, it's also included. Yeah. And uh, it's actually a quite funny story because it was my first DH race right. and uh, I was going there with my dad and he said, like, yeah, you have to race against the boys and definitely you're not going to win. He knew that I was quite competitive from ski <laughs> racing. And uh, at the end of the day, I beat all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. So, yeah. what, we, you're obviously, like, a winner. What are you like when you lose? Are you a pleasure to be around? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I'm not that pissed at right. that moment. It's yeah. more like when I think about it, like, Three hours later, I'm like, damn it, like I <laughs> fucked it up. And then, uh, I don't know, it just gives me a really big push to be even better the next race. And then I'm like, yeah, I'm going to beat them by a big margin. And uh, that's my goal. <laughs> and is that at downhill or is that losing at anything? So say, I don't know, Christmas time, your family are playing cards or whatever. Do you have to win at that as well? Or are you, is it just downhill that... Well, I think my dad is even more competitive when it comes to family <laughs> games, so uh, it's really hard. <laughs> well, that's where you get that from. Yeah, maybe. So, Thibaut, are we right in thinking that you started racing downhill in 2016 as a youth? Mm, not really. I was riding mountain bike and downhill, even when I was younger. I was just doing BMX races, so as you can ride, uh, can't ride... Uh, proper races in downhill before yeah. 14 in France. Yeah. So I decided to do only BMX races as you can do world championships, European cups and even French cups. So until um, 15, yeah. yeah, 15 years old, uh, 
I decided to do only uh, BMX and then moved to, to downhill. That was what I loved the most and it was my main goal okay, to, nice. to start in junior for the World Cups. Yeah. Were you good at the BMX racing? Uh, yeah, for, for three years I was uh, the best in Europe, like <laughs> almost, like kind of, and in the eighth of the world. Wow. Okay. Uh, approximately, and in France, yeah. I was I won a lot of French cups, and I was the yeah. yeah first. So you had a you had a solid background in racing before you moved to the the downhill racing. Yeah. I, I think I've done more BMX races than downhill for sure. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. How old were you when you started racing the BMX? My first race was when I was seven years old. Wow. And okay. then yeah, after I just tried to do cross country. Yeah. Then, like we have some of like uh, French uh, races when you where you have uh, downhill, cross country, trail, and uh, like uh, yeah, those four disciplines in the same day. And I don't know if you have that in England, but no, I was doing that. Too. I guess the closest thing we've got to that is what um, Peyton organizes. What's it called? Yeah, the Malvins. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So yeah, we've maybe got one event that's a little bit, bit like that. Yeah. Um, Okay. Oh, cool. So I um I looked through your Instagram today and found some photos of you riding uh, a lap here in 2017 um, with the the one plate on at the races. Um, were, were you the fastest youth rider in France in 2017? Were you winning the youth races on that lap year? Uh, yeah, I think uh, in 2000 I rode with lap year in 2016 and 17. Yeah. Uh, I think I lose only one races because I I tried to push a bit too much because I would like to be on the podium with uh, with the elite yeah. on the French Cup and I crash massive crash. Yeah, I think it's the only race I lost in the lost in the two years. Okay, cool. So did the common cell athlete manager Pierre did he kind of talent spot you? Is that how you got the ride with common cell? Um, no, before it was, uh, I think, uh, Max called me or I don't know, I think it was more the reference brother, but yeah. like we were, they were all one year before they were like, oh yeah, we were talking a bit, yeah. not for a contract or nothing, just, uh, we were a bit friend yeah. and re then, then in the summer, uh, 2017, I decided to try the, the bike. Yeah and the bike was working super good so yeah. i decided to go with them and even because the team was already super good and yeah, yeah i think Everything it was a right. really big the best choice in for the moment in my life i think nice yeah i was going to ask you did you instantly love the bike what what are your favorite things about the way the supreme rides yeah uh, uh all the year long uh, everybody was trying the 2019 29 uh, wheels yeah and uh, on the lap year yeah. I, I could have put them, but uh, it was a, a strange moment to do that because I was uh, really young. And if I go, like, when you're young, you're not as supposed to have uh, 29, blah, 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 you know? Yeah. yeah. So I decided to stay with the 27. And it was the first time I tried the 29, and pff, I love it. Yeah. Uh, it was so fast, and the bike was really dynamic compared to the lap year. And yeah. it was what I really like on the bike because it was uh, more similar than the um, BMX bike. Yeah. So that was the main point for, yeah. for the bike. Nice. So you've had some great success as a junior rider, um, beating lots of elites with your race times. Um, I remember coming to congratulate you in Loser at the start of 2019 when you'd had an absolute storm of a race run and you'd come third in the elite category, you'd won the junior category. Have all the elites been as friendly when you've been doing so well? Has everybody, everybody been cool or are you sensing a little bit of uh, rivalry of anticipation of you got moving into elite? No, not really. Uh, everybody's really keen, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, keen. yeah. Uh, everybody. That's kind of our sport, isn't it? Everybody's just kind of like, yeah, yeah. All riding That's their own bikes. And... Nothing bad. And nice. no, no, everybody's really nice with me. Awesome. Well, I'm sure a lot of people are really excited to watch your first World Cup season, that's for sure. 
Yeah, I was too, but I was not supposed to to ride the first few rounds so with my knee, but now yeah. I think I'm, I will be for ready. sure ready. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, I'm a bit lucky. Yeah. Ali, let's start with the World Cups for you. 2018, you're a first year junior, the perfect season. You won all seven rounds of the World Cup and World Championships. At what point did the pressure of the perfect season start? When did people kind of start talking about it? I was actually quite uh, unexpected. Uh, it wasn't really planned because <laughs> I just came into the World Cup and was thinking I'm just going to try it. And then yeah. somehow I won the first race and the second one and the third one. And it just rolled that way. And uh, I was like, wow, it's a... Uh, actually quite easy <laughs> uh, and then uh, yeah when I crashed the first time in Leogang the first year I was like well okay it's really hard to be like always consistent and always have a race run with without any crashes and then uh, I don't know even with the crash I won but I knew that you really have to concentrate on what you're doing and it's not that easy like like I thought and uh, I think it was like the race after after months and end because it was La Bresse and then there were walls. Yeah. And uh, La Bresse was like the race where I thought, wow, if I could win it, that would be like the first like first elite uh, junior year and the first perfect season. Yeah. And yeah, that was super fun. And the conditions were terrible in La Bresse, weren't they? It was one of those races that you could have quite easily lost. Oh, yeah, it was super wet like it rained so hard it was super cold yeah. uh and you couldn't see like from the start gate it was like off fog and you couldn't see anything <laughs> yeah um what was your standout performance in 2018 which which one of those wins did you ride the best which one were you the most you know happy with well it's hard to say i think like winning leo gang with a crash yeah, was uh, unexpected for me for sure because I thought like, cool, I have a home race, but I totally fucked up my run. <laughs> but uh, at the end, I still won, so I what? was really happy about that one. What did you do after you crashed? Did you panic and go like hell to the finish, thinking you could still do it, or did you just kind of get back on and just ride down, thinking you'd thrown it away? No, run? I was like super hectic. It was like the the last turn before you enter the motorway section. So like I lost all the speed and I was like sprinting yeah. and I can't remember the run from, from that crash on. And uh, there's a guy from Austria. He's like always checking all the splits. And he said, the last split, I was faster than Rachel Atten. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> on the chase. Nice. Yeah. So I can't remember. Maybe I have to do that more often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take your brain out. Um, yeah. Moving on to the World Championships then, that season, did you feel a, a lot of pressure going into Lenza High? I was really exciting because it was my first time like going with the national team. Like we don't really have a national team, but first time like racing for your country, you have you have the jersey and I got a special bike the first time, so it was super sick. And uh, it's just a different vibe. Like everyone is more focused, but at the same time, I don't know, really happy about everything because yeah. it's different. People stay with different people. They stay with the national team and some people stay with the team. So a little bit different, but uh, for sure, like the atmosphere is, is amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you won seeding by 11 seconds in Lenzerheide. How did that affect your mental preparation for your race run? Mm, so I actually won like all races before so I was like really confident and I knew that I could do it but at that point like I said all like seating runs and race run I did they were perfect like when is the time I'm gonna crash like really crash or get a flat tire or chain snaps or so I was just waiting for for something bad to happen but it didn't <laughs> so you were a little nervous going into the run thinking yeah for sure wrong. it was like the first time you have like a different kind of of heart beating you know that like it's yeah. like really from your stomach and it's like beating so hard you're like oh my god what's going on yeah it's like totally different uh, kind of nerves yeah did you find that went away as soon as you left the start gate because i always find if i ever feel like that as soon as i've put the first pedal stroke in it goes away 
did you did that happen or did it follow you down the track i think it's always when the guy in the start had the french guy always says like un minute <laughs> like then it's like clicking it's Ray's so funny off. like the guy yeah and uh, yeah. then it's like go time it's good so you you went on to win the race and by a, another big margin, 11 seconds. When we talked to Tani last weekend about winning her first World Cup, um, and she, she said the overriding feeling was relief. Um, given the pressure and the way you were feeling, how did you feel when you won the race? I was awesome. Like all my family was down there and I had a perfect season. But at the same time, I was like thinking, God, I have to do that next year again. Yeah. You can't do better. You can only do worse. Yeah. So I was like, wow, oh my God, what did I do? Yeah. But no, nah, actually, like, everything was fine. And I still had motivation to train, even though I didn't get beat or something. So. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe a tough question. Have you spent any of the last two seasons riding within yourself in your race runs? Because you, you have kind of known that you're very capable of winning the race. Have you, have you been riding under your limit? Yeah, for sure. And uh, that was the time like I got beaten. Because <laughs> yeah. I knew like I won, I won the seating and I knew like I don't have to give my very... Yeah. I mean, it, it may sound yeah. a little bit shitty for me saying that, but I knew like I don't have to give like 100% to win my category. Yeah. And then... Uh, like my mindset was totally totally off. Like I wasn't taking practice seriously. I, I didn't do like a lot of runs. I didn't do time practice and stuff like that, which was like super stupid. Mm. But I think it's good to have junior years to to do that kind mm. of bullshit. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you you go to the race and then you get like the hit in your face and you see what you have done wrong. So yeah, Miller beat me in Valley Soul by yeah. only like one second, but it was just because it like didn't take it serious yeah yeah Yeah. okay well as you just said important lesson learned and that's that's what those junior years are for Tibor 2018 you joined Common Cell you joined at the the same time as Amaury did everyone in France know that Amaury was going to be a special rider I don't really know but I think everybody will known that Amory was really really fast and uh, because uh, when you see him on on the track he was always really fast on some sections but sometimes he had so many mechanicals or I don't know problems yeah uh, and when he moved to the comments of Van Ortiem I think the the bike will fits him perfectly and yeah everything was there and just go faster uh, all, all all the tracks so the reason the reason i asked that is prior to the kind of 2018 season i was at revolution bike park and here in the uk and i was talking to joe breeden and he predicted that a maori would win the the world cup overall in 2018 and the reason i kind of it always stuck with me is i remember calling someone on the way home and them saying to me who's a maori Pier on and I was like oh he came second in Val di Sol I think last year and it was kind of now when you look back it's like oh it's a Maori Pier on but at the time he wasn't that well known to everyone so I just didn't know if in you guys he was like in, in, to the French riders you were all just like oh yeah he's just going to be great in a few years time. I think it was one of them as well like when you're around it I think it was 2015 Lords is that right when did he podium? Was it 2015 or 2016? Can, you, can anyone? No, remember? 16. 16. I think. Okay. Right. So he podiumed in Lords, and he was riding so well, and then he broke both arms in Cairns, and then he came back at the end of the season, and podiumed in Andorra, I think, or Val And when you're around it, when you're at the races, you see all that, and you right. see that talent, and you know yeah. it's there. Whereas if you're just watching Red Bull and you're just getting what's pushed into into your face on the screen you'll miss those things of who's showing real potential and could come about and that's why Breeden will have will have seen that and gone he has a good way to do it so 2018 you're a first year junior as well and as we said on the intro you finished top three at every round winning in Le Chien, Val de Sol, Val Nord, Mont Saint-Anne and Le Bresse was it a surprise to you just how dominant you were 
Yeah, it was uh, because my main goal was to be consistent and to try to win uh, one races or more if it was possible. Yeah. But after Login, uh, when I, I won the race, I saw that I was maybe capable of winning multiple races. So yeah. I just continued to try my best to, to win more races. And yeah. which was, was your standout performance that season? No, it was good. Favorite race was win. Good. Yeah, which was your favorite one? Your favorite win? Um, I think it was Lodging because I love that track because yeah. it's kind of a numb track with a lot of rocks and like uh, like French uh, French track, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think it's this one. And yeah. And maybe Valno because I love this track too. <laughs> yeah. At, at what point in the season had you won the overall? Oh, in 2018? 18, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, it was uh, at Monsatan. Maybe oh, I had to okay. do a podium and then just won the overall. So yeah, I was, nice. I was so, so happy. So world, world Championships in Lenzerheide, you seeded fourth and you were 10 seconds back on Cade. You finished fourth, six seconds back on Cade. Looking at those stats alone, it gives the impression that you, you know, you'd, you'd been beating Cade during the season, that you weren't quite there that weekend. Was that, was that the case? Um, I think this weekend I was maybe too confident. Yeah. And, and as Vadi says before, I was not really focused in practice, was not taking the risk to, to try to go fast at some sections and... Yeah, I was not. I was not uh, with. I was not with my team. I was with the French team, just going with the team uh, during the day, and that was. I was not in my comfort zone. So, yeah, just so many little things that made not a good weekend. So, yeah, it was a really bad weekend for me. Did Did you feel a lot of pressure after winning the overall? No, no. no. I think I like the pressure, and that what make me going faster. And yeah, I think Eraser. that made me at the at the World Championship. I was like, no, almost no pressure. Yeah, the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so, Valley, moving on to 2019, you won round one in Maribor by 10 seconds, which is a huge margin, really, when we remember that for the elite men, the top 50 within 10 seconds of Loic. Um, so the question is, what was the bigger surprise? Winning Maribor by 10 seconds or then not winning in Fort William? Well, I crashed in Fort William. So uh, I don't know. I was actually quite happy that the kind of winning streak, even though it was just in juniors, was like over finally because I it was good somehow. I mean, I was yeah. super pissed that in, at the end that I crashed and did a mistake and only like, lo yeah, I was only three seconds back even though I crashed. Where, so, where uh, did you crash? Uh, it was before the the road gap. And then after the road gap, I like slid out before the, the water road gap. Oh, like the, the, the hoofer gap. thing, yeah, the hazard hoofer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was like super messy because I had like zero speed and then you have to pedal all the way out. So. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I had like two big mistakes in one race run. So maybe like I did all the mistakes from last year <laughs> in that one. Nah. So yeah, yeah. I was happy that it was finally over. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that because as something like that goes on longer and longer, yeah, the pressure's going to mount and people are watching. And once it's over, you can just carry on. And, uh, yeah. And I was super happy for Anna that she could also win because I could feel that last year was hard or like you could see that they also wanted to win but it like never happens yeah. so i was super happy for them that they both could get a podium yeah she had a joy yeah. in fort william you've raced three times and only won once so that is the track that you've got the worst record on um do you feel there's a reason for that is it something you don't like about fort william or something you find hard or has it just been one of those things no i just think because the track is so physical and like in Austria we don't have that long tracks it's like super steep so you don't race for that long and for William it's like super flat it's like nearly for for the girls it's like five minutes mm. so uh, 
I guess even for juniors and girls, it's super hard for, for the arms. You get arm pump and you look, kind of lose the focus and then you make mistakes pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it is a tough I one. mean, I love the trick, so. Yeah, it is a good one. But it is very hard and, yeah, whenever we race the national, some of the nationals, some of the riders, they have to take maybe six to seven minutes to get down and I wouldn't want to ride that track for seven minutes. That's yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but that must be pretty tiring, eh, George? It is. Yeah, I, I, I would love to. I, I would love to see you guys try and ride for seven minutes. I can do it. That's enduro. I've tried that. No, nope. no. I, I think <laughs> I think I've done a six or six thirty something, maybe six forty something, something like that. I think that's my best run down there. But I, I find of all the tracks we race in the UK, and I've raced Andorra and Val di Sol as well. Fort William is my least favorite track. I've never, I've never enjoyed racing it. I've just, I don't find it an enjoyable track to ride. I think it's, yeah, it's like a, you know, you guys are professional. I'm not a professional rider. I'm a, an amateur rider, but I find that it's hard. By the time you get to the deer gate, I don't have the strength and the fitness that you guys do. And by the time you get to the deer gate, that is like a, a run anywhere else in the uk pretty much you know that 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 half of track and then it's not as bad now but a few years ago the 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 bit after that before they put the new section in that was really really hard it, it was really hard on the body and then you come into the jumps at the bottom which i'm okay with them now i'll do them now but years ago when you're not that level rider and you're dreading hitting those jumps and they're at the bottom and you can barely feel you know your arms is you got arm pump or whatever and you're thinking i'm gonna have to try and hit a 30 foot gap here i i can't feel my wrist you know i can't feel am i going to be able to hold on so as a kind of amateur i it's just i'm always glad when i'm coming home from there really stressful weekend and it is one of those tracks where if you're not just flowing and carrying speed you're just hitting every rock in the wrong place and it's just beating your arms up and when you get into that speed where you know it's right Oh, it just gets so much easier. Yeah. So, yeah, I can relate to that, George. So, Valley, you bounced back from Fort William um, and you won Leo Gang by 19 seconds, which must have felt great after crashing the year before. Was that your favourite performance of 2019? Nah, it was uh, Liché in France, of course. <laughs> and, wh- and why is that? Well, because uh, I was the fastest lady on the on the day, so that was pretty sick. And uh, yeah. it was actually quite unexpected because it was not a not a race run like where you're like, wow, that was sick or that was something impressive. I don't know. It was just a normal race run, and I didn't really check the time. I didn't know that that one was even faster than than the qualifying from uh, Marine, I think, or Tracy. Mm-hmm. And uh, then later the day, I just watched the live uh, on the TV in the truck at SRAM. And then uh, I just saw that Tracy was slower. And I was like, wow, that's weird. Like, I just won the what's women. happening? Like, what, what are they doing? Why is it so, so slow? <laughs> and, uh, and then Marine also was slow. And I was like, wow, there must be something wrong. Like, there must be something on the track and stuff. But I don't know. I just... Uh, and tried the trick really. Did, yeah. Were you were you fastest as well in Lenzerhide? Yeah, I was too. Yeah. So you twice last season you were the fastest female racer. You must kind of leave with an extra buzz when you've when you've been when you've done that. I don't know, cause uh, like you can't really compare it like hundred percent, cause. There are always people who say, ah, the trick was different or it was more slippery or it was more bumpier and stuff. Well, I, think, I don't know. Uh, I can't remember. Lens I had it rained and then it didn't rain and rained and it didn't rain. It was just a nightmare. But Leger was fair and square. Like it was, it was the same all day, I'd say. So legitimate win, I'd say. Um, <laughs> has a junior woman ever won an elite time george do we know, if know. It, it was un- it was uncle so she has uncle done. Uncle Rochester, yeah. but it's been a long time then since it's been done so <laughs> big, yeah. big achievement okay you you won again in valnord but you were second to millie in valdisol 
by a very small margin. Did did anything kind of go specifically wrong in Val Sol? Yeah, that was like the day where I didn't take stuff seriously. Like the whole right. weekend, I, I was not taking it seriously. I wasn't really concentrating on the track. I was like not in a good mood. I don't know. There were like so many little things that made the weekend really, really bad for me. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, you learn from that things and I'm happy that it happened. So I know that I have to approach the weekend differently and always try to have a good mindset, even though like Val de Sol in the rain is not fun. No. So And it's super scary, but you still have have to find a way to, to be a happy person. Yeah. I, I, I heard you use the word scared of Val de Sol in the rain. And it's not often you hear top level racers admitting to that emotion how I'm scared much... of the soul in the rain <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, but it... what do you think Tebo? are you scared of it oh yeah i was so scared and <laughs> yeah, i did a really bad race too uh, in valley so i almost yeah. i learned a very important lesson the year before and you you two may remember but it it rained halfway through men's qualies in 2018 yeah. and i tried to play it safe I didn't crash, but I was in some spots so painfully slow just to stay on my bike. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I was 67th in quali or something. Last year, it did exactly the same thing. So I had, um, I didn't have full spikes with me, but I had some cuts that still had the side nobbles on and I had the right tires on and I'd learned from the year before and I qualified seventh. Um, and it goes back to what Valley said before, like, something that can be so shit at the time you can learn from it and wind the clock forwards and just get so much from it so yeah valdestol in the wet is uh yeah it's lethal <laughs> it's pretty scary <laughs> so i knew you didn't really like comparing your your times to the elites valley but let's talk about crankworks because there you did actually re- race in the elite category and at those you know, we, we can compare those times legitimately. The air downhill, you were third behind Jill Kittner and Georgia Astle, three seconds off the win. But more interestingly, the Canadian Open, you were second 0.6 back on Tracy with Miriam a further 0.6 back in third. How, how did it feel to be kind of competing in the, on, in the, you know, being in the start gate with, them, with those ladies? I was super cool. First of all, it was the first time I was like in live TV. Yeah. Like that was like a big bonus for me. And uh, after getting third at the Air Air DH in Whistler, I was actually the only one who was riding a DH bike. Right. So maybe for next year. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, it was super cool. Like going up the chairlift and you see like all your heroes warming up Pom Pom and Tracy and it was unreal. Like it was like super cool atmosphere and uh then you drop in and you sit in the hot seat and the best races in the world, like right down the hill and you're just waiting and see the time go past. So it was unreal. <laughs> cool. yes. But by the time world champs can came around and you, well, I think you'd won the overall it, given that you'd won the overall twice and already been junior world champion. Was that an easier race than the previous season? Mont Saint Anne? Mm. I think the track is like a little bit harder than Lenzerheide. It's yeah. like super long and I actually like that weekend I had so many big crashes. Like really, I think a lot of people crashed that weekend and like beat themselves up. Right. So like, and even like you have one extra day of training. So there's like more risk to crash again. <laughs> so I was like super sore on Sunday, but I was like enjoying it. And I won the qualifying with a big margin, even though I crashed. So I knew like I have a big gap. And this time I was playing like safe. I wasn't giving 100%, but I knew like I'm, I have to be focused on make the same mistake like in Valley Soul. Mm-hmm. And uh, just played safe and I know I could win again. And uh, I was super stoked about the performance and like the consistency. Cool. Nice. So, um... Tibor, you hit 2019 like a wrecking ball, um, winning the first three rounds. We then went to round four in Valnord, which is obviously Common Cell's home territory. I imagine you were putting a lot of pressure on yourself to not only win, but win big 
and win with some style. Yeah, uh, my main goal at the beginning of the season was, the season was just to be consistent and yet yeah, try to do a perfect season with winning all the races. But I just I won the first three rounds and then I got to Val Noir. I was super good on the bike and I just say, okay, forget that and just try to go fast as I want, you know, just riding as I can. Yeah. Me not being a on the what I could can do and yeah the first two speed I think I was fast a bit too much maybe <laughs> yeah and yes. then I got... you won seeding oh. by 13 seconds didn't you um and then you were 10 seconds up and yeah. maybe more at the split before you crashed in the race run um after winning seeding by such a big margin what was the thinking behind your race run were, were you trying to get a time to rival the elites or were you just, mm. just going for it? No, I was really focused. I really, I was really checking the lines, doing everything I can to do the best I, as I can, but not really to compare with the with the elites. But uh, was just to try to do the fastest run I can, even if it was the only time I can do it uh, in the year, because the the next races uh, I had to to win again to try to win the overall, but. Uh, yeah, after the jump part, I just crashed because I forgot to, to take the break and yeah, just massive crash. I think yeah. it could have been worse if I hurt a tree or something, but yeah. And did, you, did you clip a pedal on the tree? No, not really. I, I don't know what's happened, but uh, I think I just see I was going too fast and just I don't know, try to go next to the bike and yeah, it was, was really it, horrible. Was it just after that gap into the right hand corner? Yeah, exactly. Was it the hole? There was a big hole into the turn, was it the hole? Yeah, or was it not? yeah, yeah, it was just before the hole. I think I just tried to. Just, yeah, too fast. Yeah, too fast. And then I didn't have the, the, the place to, to break. And then I think I could have, I can't have turned. Yeah, well, yeah, it was like a, it's a fairly flattish corner, isn't it? And there's always a huge yeah. hole there that you could like, yeah. lose yourself in. And yeah, if you if you don't have time to slow down, then it's going to be easy to have a crash. So, yeah. So your national championships were in Alp Duez. I seem to remember the track being. Was it part of the Mega Avalanche track? No, no, it was. Oh, maybe. Oh, maybe, but it was so flat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like grass corners and rocky, strange. Yeah, it was just strange track. Yeah. Like really, not even enduro, but I don't know, like a typical, typical French, trench track. Yeah, so French would, racing, yeah. Yeah, you, fun to ride. You, you won the junior title. Remy Tiron won the elite men's race, but you set the fastest time of the day. So you also took the elite win. Is, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So like Amari and Loris have sat that race out, Remy must right. be thinking the jersey's mine for the taking here, but his young teammate kind of swoops in and takes it. How pissed with you was he? Uh, no, it was okay because, you know, he's a really nice guy. So there isn't, we are not like, <laughs> Competitive between us, and but it was amazing to win a race in Elite. Yeah. Okay. When uh, I heard that Hamari, Loris were not coming, and even Loic. Yeah. I say okay, they are not coming, so I'm I'm going to to show that they they must have come. <laughs> so I try to win. All the week it was there. Has, has Remy been national champion before? I don't know. I think maybe I don't know. Maybe in junior. Right, okay. But, uh, I don't know in edit. I think uh, Loic won uh, all the races. <laughs> I think, was it, didn't the year before, was it not Gaetan Viz? That was the, yeah. the, the exactly. muddy one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, terrible. <laughs> yeah. So do you get to wear the sleeve in 2020 then? Do you get to? Yeah, I had yeah? to. But I think I will not <laughs> wear it. Yeah, Why? Because it'll change over, George, before we go racing. Ah, yeah. yeah. 
Sorry, I, I don't know. know. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We will see. It's not a really big problem. <laughs> Just <No. to> see. <laughs> Back to the World Cup then. You won five rounds in total in 2019 and amassed over double the number of points of Kaya Hearn in second place. Which was the, the standout performance for you in 2019? Um, I don't know if thing. No, I think even if I crash, I think it was well known. Yeah, yeah, yeah because you were riding well. You were, you were yeah, on it. Yeah, I think it was the best week. I was. I, I think I did everything uh, I had to do during a, a week races. Yeah. You know, I think it, it was. Uh, I was prepared as if I, I would be in elite. Yeah, like the lines, uh, everything. Uh, I think it was the best weekend, even if I crashed. Yeah. Yeah. So be it. So, yeah. Well, World Champs 2019, you seeded fifth and finished fifth. Only two seconds off the win, though. How did that leave you feeling? Was it a different emotion to 2018? Yeah, completely. Because after Val Noor, um I win Leger. Okay, yeah. it was a good race. But then, I don't know why it goes crazy in the... Uh, in Valley Soleil, where I crashed, I almost, I hurt my wrist. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of crazy thing happened. I had a flat tire here in Lenza Hyde, first corner for nothing, like, I don't know. And then in uh, Monsatan, after the first pit, I just snapped the chain. And uh, right. so I was unlucky for the yeah. last round. So it didn't even surprise me. It was just normal. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And uh, when I I saw that the, that the chain was gone, I don't even try to push. Just go to the the bottom of the track and see what's the time. I just don't even push. I just take it easy and any risks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're like the the new Aaron Gwynn. You you win no. the World Cup overall, but can't you know you haven't been successful at the World Championships. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure you, I'm sure you would take that, so that that career. Yeah, for sure. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no problem. But uh, yeah, it, it's a I hope one day I can win a, a world championship. Yeah, even of course. So um, back to Common Cell. What has it been like being on the big Common Cell team the last two years? Amazing, you know. Uh, the the team has been has been so successful. Uh, since uh, Amory is, is coming and me, and uh, it's a big evolution since we, since the beginning, like in the 2017 winter, everything has changed a lot to yeah. to this winter. You know, mm -hmm. we move with Makov, and uh, we switch uh, the wheels and uh, a lot of little things but the team is going bigger and bigger and you see the difference and it's amazing to 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 work with everybody and yeah it's uh it's great yeah it does always seem like a, a nice vibe in the pits um miriam omri and yourself have won a lot of world cups um and remy's won a world cup in andorra it's pretty rare for a, a world cup team to have four riders who've all um one World Cup races. George, do we do we know how many the four of them have won between them? I don't know. I haven't had a chance to work that out. Me and George were speculating on whether you, between you you've won more than Minar or not. Oh, think I think yeah, because Amory has won maybe six six yeah. uh, World Cups. Yeah, Miriam won. maybe fifth, me t tenth. Yeah, oh, easy. And Amor and one for Remy. I think it's something like that. Yeah. If you had the World Championships for. Miriam, she has yeah. one. Yeah, I think we'll be good. <laughs> so you're you're the collective goat, really, then. <laughs> <laughs> so one yeah, thing yeah, I do yeah. know about your team is how involved the uh, head engineer Arthur is. I always kind of see him up on the hill looking at lines, and then he's under the the team tent um, at the races talking with you guys. He's a he's a real gent. He's a nice guy, and he's even been and asked me what I think of the bike and. Um, helps me out at events. How valuable is Arthur's input into that team? Because that's something that people watching on the Red Bull would have no idea. Uh, goes yeah, on. for sure. Hey, he's a quiet guy, but 
he's thinking a lot <laughs> maybe too much sometimes but uh, yeah he's such a nice guy and he helped us a lot on so many aspects like on the bike uh like on the lines sometimes and like you know, on everything i think even in, on the team process and yeah team, team process. process yeah yeah i think like uh yeah, he's an engineer, so he's so intelligent and he has so many ideas and yeah, he helped us to, to, to grow and yeah, even to go faster, but not just faster, even like, yeah, he's, I, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah, he's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, well, as I say, when, whenever I walk past, you can, or whenever I pop in, you can tell he's a, he's a vital part of what's going on in that team. Yeah. And you can see he's always trying to make the bike the perfect bike, and you can see why that Supreme's been been such a winning machine. What well, one that thing? Is, I, oh, sorry, sorry. one thing I I didn't ask you about was that French World Championships team is quite kind of renowned for they put a lot into that. They have line spotters on the hill. They have a, a big team of people trying to win. How how different was it to being on? The common cell team on a on a weekly basis. Uh, on the world championship. Yeah, being for, on the French team with, the, yeah. it, they they put a lot into trying. Their, their national federation, your national federation, put a lot into trying to win world championships. Was it different to being on the common cell team, or you know, you the common cell team has been the most successful team probably of the last two two seasons. Was it any different, really? Yeah, it was really different, you know, because even if they put a lot of work, we have our, like, uh, all the, during the whole season, we are with, with the our team. Uh, so we change everything to go with the French national team. Yeah. Uh, even if they are doing a great job with the lines, the videos and everything. Yeah. You can change everything in one week. So yeah. I don't know if it's a good option or not, but... Uh, they are doing a good job, but I think uh, it's better if we stay in our team and continue to do yeah. the job we do, even if it's not, not the same. But but they're really helpful for the Lions, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I I, I completely agree. It's uh, you wouldn't see a Formula One team do everything the same for nineteen races. Exactly, the final race of the year, send a driver off with different staff, and yeah, you just wouldn't do it. So. Yeah, I, just, uh, I can completely understand where you're coming from. Valley, do you uh, do you look at teams like the big common cell team and and think, oh, that looks fun. That looks like <laughs> is that is that an aim for you to get get on a team like that? Yes, uh, of course. I mean, uh, the SRAM team is awesome. I have everything I need. I have my mechanic. Like uh, we can travel everywhere we want. I can test all new products I want to. And uh, even with met my mechanic, it's it's is that a big help because for a girl like you're not really into all the weird suspension thing or like testing stuff or so it's good that you have someone who is like doing the stuff for you but like in the second year like last year I like really wanted to test stuff and change stuff even though like we had different opinions but I just wanted to try out what feels good and what feels bad yeah and uh, of course like especially like uh, a world champs that like, you only see the French team like nearly every five meters there's someone with the French uh, uniform on is like filming you and like, yeah, what the fuck? like I'm Austrian we had two people racing from Austria uh, it was a bit weird and uh, I was lucky because Cecile Ravanel was uh, racing with me the first year like in 2018 yeah so I could follow her all the time but some day the French uh, chef trainer said that he's not really happy that Cecile is riding with a non-Frenchy right. at world, so that was like a weird situation. But Cecile is pretty cool, and she just uh, continued in riding with me, so I was nice. really happy to get some yeah. help. Yeah. Cool. Before we move into the future, talking about the future, there's a few things we wanted to ask you about. And firstly, who did you both look up to when you were kind of aspiring to be World Cup racers? Who's who's the hero? Uh, Valley first, girl first. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, for sure, Rachel Atkinson. Yeah. Okay, and have you met her? Yeah. 
Yeah, and what what was that like? Do you get star? Was it a bit starstruck or? Oh, too! I was like over the moon. Like yeah. I can't even like stand next to her because I'm like <laughs> so super over excited, and uh, it's just uh, crazy to talk to her. She's like super, super into racing, like yeah. super focused, and uh, just different mindset and approaching things different, and like makes everything to be the best on the day and beat everyone. That's yeah. so impressive. And what do you think it'll be like when you race against her? I don't know. Yeah. I hope she's going to be nice. <laughs> <Still>. <laughs> do you think it'd be quite a, a big thing to be kind of... Uh, Tani said last week that w one of the things for her psychologically was that she wanted Rachel to be at the bottom of the track waiting for Tani to come down to see if she... You know, so she wasn't in control of her own destiny almost, I think it was. And then Tani see the lights go green, yeah. Yeah. Is that is that what you think about? Is that do you think Well I never, I never had the problem. I was always a last girl at the yeah. mountain, uh, the last two years. So I don't know how that but, feels like but But is that a big thing? Do you want to are, are you looking like, forward to the day you're like you've got Rachel, you know, you you're you have qualified first and they're all waiting for you to come down is that something you're oh definitely like one day for sure but i think i don't know how many re how many years rachel will be still racing and uh, and you have like still you have you have tani and all those amazing racers who are like such good bike riders and uh i think it takes a bit i'm not gonna like go into elite and, and start winning it's not how it works i need to to work hard for that and uh I'm just super happy to be finally up there with them. Yeah. Can't yeah. wait. Go on then, Tiba. Who was the yeah. hero? My hero? It's uh, Aaron Green. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, I can say that. <laughs> and, yeah. Have you, so have you met him? He's by me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe not the first year because uh, I tried to, to talk to him and everything, but I uh, was a bit too shy and he was... Uh, yeah. Not here, you know, you don't see him a lot on the... Yeah, on the he's quite a quiet guy as well, Aaron. Yeah, and last, last year, uh, the first race in Maribor, uh, just, yeah, I go to see him in the pits and we, we start to chat. And yeah. yeah, it was so simpatical. And yeah, we talk a few minutes, you know, and then uh, again in Leogang in the Gondola and then in the other race. And no, a few minutes, you know, it's not, uh, it's not yeah. my friend, but... Uh, we talk a bit and uh, yeah, it's a really nice guy. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Good. What's the, the one thing, if you, if you had to pick one thing that you've both learned over the last two years of World Cup racing, what's the one thing that you would, you would pick out? Valley? That's a big question. It is. Uh, <laughs> most important <laughs> lesson you've learned. Yeah, the most important lesson you've learned. Is it the complacency thing you, you mentioned before? I don't know. It's it's really hard. I think I need to think about it, but it's definitely like uh, use the time you get on practice day right. and do time practice, even though like maybe you don't want to or you're tired, but really like use the time on the first day and like watch other people do lines, even though like you don't have that much training time, but really use the time and stop and watch other people yeah. where, they, where they ride. Because, uh, I mean, it's different if you have a big team and they film and then you have people telling you, oh, he's trying that one. But when you're alone, like, I really need to stop and watch other people. And then I think that's a big thing that could help you. Yeah. Tiba? Yeah, I, there is not a main thing that, that there is so many little points that I learned during the two seasons. Yeah. I think it's the two seasons that I learned the most in my life, you know on the bike off the bike uh during the race after the race so to me there is no one point i think i can't say there is one main point uh, but uh no i don't know <laughs> but maybe the, the yeah the lines for sure taking more time on the track yeah. that could be the best thing Tibo, i wanted to ask you sorry george um, yeah, no, go on. i wanted to ask you earlier and i forgot just talking about idols has reminded me. Um, so obviously you're moving into elite. Um, what's 
the vibe going to be like in the pits the first time you beat Omri at a World Cup when you both had a good run? <laughs> I don't know if it will happen right now, you know. Maybe it will take a few years. Yeah. I hope no, you know. But, uh, but do you think he'll take uh, it? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. When, when is, you, he, is he a super competitive kind of guy? Because we've had, we had, uh, we were talking about this last week that Danny Hart said to Loic on a podcast that he really struggles to be all happy for other people at the bottom because he's there to win. And then mm. a lot of other riders can be quite sporting and be cool about not winning. What's Omri like when he doesn't win? Uh, I think he, he, like on his face, you can see that he's happy, even if he does, didn't want. But after the race, you can see that he's not happy. Yeah. <laughs> when he's angry, you know, you saw him. But uh, he's a good guy too. So if it's not like he's not uh, not talking to you or saying shit, he's not like that. Absolutely not. So he stay nice and just the next race you guys will still be friends 10 seconds back <laughs> when, when you're when you're all riding together say we're not yeah. a race does he let you go first him yeah did they let I, you go first him and Remy uh, he's always first in the timing everything he's doing maybe the double like uh, more runs than us right. more chronos everything he's doing more yeah, like he's never tired. Always uh, energy. He's a strong always guy. Fast. The best time he's doing uh, during the team camp it's at uh, seven p.m. during the night. But for real, in San Remo, on the other track of the of the world. <laughs> yeah, that is a rough track. Oh, yeah, great... yeah, yeah, you two but of people. You you finished two thousand and nineteen with a trip to Wales. I know you yeah. rode at Revolution Bike Park and at Bike Park Wales. Not many people come to Wales in December. We mm. don't really go to Wales in December, me and Jack. What prompted that trip? Because it's pretty tough, Wales, in, in December. Yeah, but the goal was to ride in tough conditions. Right. Uh, but okay. I have a friend uh, which is from Wales. I don't know where he's exactly, but yeah, he's English. So yep. it was pretty easy to go there and but the weather was not too bad i don't know why it was really cold in bike park wales and in revolution i think uh, in the midday was really like but like the typical weather like, like yeah. windy mm. cloudy it wasn't extreme uh, it was just you're making me shiver thinking about it <laughs> yeah but it was really good to ride in the roots and mud yeah. and like short tracks but really different than in france and even yeah, it was really nice cool yeah. and with that succinct link to revolution bike park we'll kick, take a quick break and we'll return with the revolution bike park big questions after these messages on to the revolution bike park big questions then question number one and let's do ladies first if that's all right with the team bar. Um, what's your favorite track on the World Cup circuit? I know the answer. I'm going to, yeah, go on, Valley. It's going to be Leah going, I'm guessing. Oh, sorry, I was, I was answering for T, but I don't know Valley. Sorry. No, no, no <laughs> worries, buddy. Yeah. No, nah, it's actually a Lishi. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a point. trick where, where it, there's like not really a lot, a lot of scary stuff. Yeah. Like you can go like flat out and the, big jumps and the big grass corners and stuff. Mm. I like it. It's, it's super fun. Nice. We have a track here called Mulfrey in Wales. Um, uh. George, you'll have ridden Mulfrey, won't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the top of Leger, the first minute, is almost exactly the same as Mulfrey. A little bit more turns, but but yeah, just open and fast. And yeah. Uh, um, so the, good. the Masters Worlds this year is due to be in Praloop. And I don't know if you've raced Praloop too nope. far. I yeah, that's the race where I crashed in the uh, youth category. Oh. All right, okay. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, is, is that a little bit like Leger as well? No, no, absolutely not. It's more no. like a normal track, you know, nothing. No, it's normal track, like yeah. bike park, yeah. fresh spots. I don't know whether they're going to do the, the race, but no, yeah. no, it's normal, normal track. It looks. Yeah. It like, I watched the helmet cam. It, it looked pretty good fun. It looked like a good fun track. Like I thought, yeah, Leger yeah. looked like quite a good fun track as well. 
So, Thibaut, your favourite track on the World Cup circuit? Uh, Van Lohr, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Just it has everything. because it's long, steep, physical, technical, yeah. so many lines, and yeah. it's not like really. Even if it's rain, it's not too bad. Like Valisol, you know, it could yeah. have been Valisol, but no, uh, well, no, for sure, mm -hmm. because uh, the the top of the track is a bit flat, so it's good to have everything on the same track. Mm. So yeah, it does have a lot of variety. All right, guys, question two. Um, which section of track on the World Cup circuit do you find the most difficult to race? Question? I think it's like in Valiso, like at the end where you have the really hard right-hand corner, like the steep stone yeah. man-made corner. Where Greg Renau went off track last year. Yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean, yeah. yeah. It's that like super tight and you get in quite you can get in quite fast but it's super hard to stay on track i think and you're super tired like your hands are dying yeah how do you approach yeah. that valley if you know that that's coming up and you really you know well i'm just uh, praying to, <laughs> to stay on the bike basically <laughs> like valley soul is really tough for me like uh, i need to to really practice that one all right okay to get better and to get more confidence for sure well, yeah, and same for me. Uh, exactly the same. Yeah? 100%. Yeah, I need to practice the track. The bottom of the track is horrible. My arm are ter terrible on the track. So, yeah, same. Uh, question number three. What's the, the biggest crash you've had so far? Me? Oh, Tibo, I, you go for it. Uh, me? Tibo, yeah. uh, I, I take a few big crashes. But uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, in Valnor. Yeah. Because during the, 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 the race, I take two times uh, a big crash on the head. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's the one, uh, the race uh, the race crash in Valnor. Yeah. So. Valley? Mm, I think it was in Mountain End. Like, I fell down that rock where Brook crashed down. Like, Whoa. the exact same spot like it was even on the same day like junior practice like a few hours before because i think there was like a small route mm -hmm. before you go down and then everyone like slid out they were like more juniors like antoine vidal like they all crashed the same day and like fell down the rock so uh, yeah it was scary to to hear that the brook also crashed at the exact same spot because it can go yeah. so quickly yeah. yeah on to 2020 then Valia, I believe you, you weren't planning on racing the full season this year. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. And you were going to miss two World Cups? Which, which two were you going to miss? I was uh, Le Chine and uh, for William. And yeah. was that a... I know you want to finish school, but was that kind of partly a psychological thing? Did it take the pressure off knowing that you wouldn't be competing for the overall? Well, not really, but school right now is just way more important than, than racing bikes because uh, it's, it's important that you have something. And my parents, like, really want me to finish school. And, yeah. and me too because, you know, it can happen so quickly. You can crash and never go racing again. And you still want to make something out of your life after. I mean, Absolutely. you have to be a lucky, lucky, lucky racer like Steve Pete or, or the Atherton's to, to build something in your racing career to, to live from that after you finish racing so uh yeah, yeah just wanted to get school done and then you can focus on racing yeah i wanted to go into this with you so um i i was shocked when i heard that um your school commitments meant that you wouldn't be competing in the in the first in a full world cup season after showing so much potential as a junior is it completely your choice or is it compulsory to stay in school at your age no it's like uh like a normal thing like school ends in in end of may so yeah. end of june so without william yeah so uh, i mean i didn't go to school for 12 years to uh to you know yeah. to not finish it so that yeah. would be stupid so okay. just want to get it done forever and then i don't have to go there <laughs> again 100 yeah, percent agree would you have had the choice to walk away from it this year and do a full race season if you'd wanted to 
Well, I could do the A finals like in September, but as we have the big gap, like we have three races in September, so I would have to wait like a full year to do the exams. But yeah. it's hard to like, you know, remember all the stuff you learned like the, yeah. the last eight years, and then so, um, so it would be like stupid not to do it. Yeah, definitely. A lot of young racers in the UK or who show any kind of degree of pace. Um, nothing compared with what you've achieved so far with all the podiums and all the race wins. They, they tend to completely forget about the importance of school and focus on their riding and their racing. So, yeah, I, th I think it will be really good for those kids to, to see what the example you're setting as a top athlete. Um, do, do you in, still enjoy the schoolwork or is it kind of just something that you just want to see the end of? Nah, for sure, like, it's, it's a little bit... Uh boring and it's hard to get focused when you know like you go racing and you go home on Sunday and you're back to school on Monday but I think now with Floyd and Pom Pom like you have so many good racers who like finish school and have a degree yeah. and I think that motivates young people to to get school done and then you can be like a smart racer 100%. super important yeah. yeah I started racing World Cups in 2010 and I was already into my second year of university then doing optometry so yeah I know I know the frustration fully of wanting to go racing and, and having to do your schooling but being able to be an optometrist alongside the racing I've done um, has just been so effective and I would have run out of money a long time ago and uh, not been able to build up my racing career um, without it that's for sure do you kind of have plans or any idea of jobs you'd want to do alongside racing or is it more something that you want to have for after racing well I think it's always good to have like a backup and I think you kind of owe that to your parents like they put so much money in helping you to go racing so yeah. it's the only thing you can do like get a degree in school and then uh, you can earn money from yourself if you don't earn it from racing yet so yeah, I mean, I will have my degree in May, so uh, I will see how how everything like goes on in Austria with like going to study if it's even possible. Like in yeah, so I will see if I start this year or next year. Like, gonna see how everything progresses with the stupid virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's like you said. A lot of young people don't appreciate how short a downhill career can be, um, and how little money can be involved unless you make it to the very top of the sport like those people you mentioned um so it's, it is really good to get that back up locked down at a young age um yeah, and i don't think you want to beg your parents all the time until no, you're like 28 or something 100 percent, 100 percent. um so yeah that's that's really impressive and it's it's a really mature attitude are, are you still studying any anything specific at school at the moment or is it just general Exam. I was like a, a sports school so we had like sports science which was uh, super interesting because you learned everything about like how the body works how training works so yeah I think I could learn a lot from that and uh, bring it into into racing it's been a nice crossover oh fair play that's really impressive um Thibaut what is your current situation with school where, where are you up to how, how's it working in France for you yeah, I'm, uh, I continue school. Uh, it's my first year after the baccalaureate. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe Vali knows how we how do you call that? Like after when you finish school. I don't know. Yeah, it's the baccalaureate it's like eight in French. Now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go one more year, two more year, or five more year if you want. Nice. So it's nice. my first year. One more year after that. For the moment, I'm going to do two more years to have a, a license. Yeah. Yeah. Are you studying anything specific? Uh, it's how to manage a, a firm. Yeah. Yeah, like business that. management. Business, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of that. Yeah. Awesome. And how's the coronavirus stuff um, affecting both of you in terms of exams and studies? What's the situation? I'll let you go first, Tibo. Um, it's uh, helpful, helpful for me because I just have like a distance uh, school, so I'm not doing it. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to train and doing some good things. So yeah, not too bad for the moment because it's a bit boring uh, to go to school. 
even if you had to and it's important uh, sometimes it's not really great oh 100 percent. it used to drive me up the wall but yeah you've just got to get it done haven't you yeah, yeah no yeah it's not too bad just doing it when i have to and uh, for the exam it's only next year so there is no problem for the moment that's cool yeah my my first world cup season obviously i was nowhere near the level of you guys i was just this super excited i think i must have been 20 maybe 21 but i was just super excited to be there and i missed fort william because i had exams and ugh, yeah the frustration yeah. is next level what's the situation with you in exams valley is everything on hold or is it still going ahead well like it was super weird like we get like when the news came that the corona virus is going to affect us really bad like we got like kind of kicked out of school like really quickly and yeah. uh, austria is not really well prepared with all the distance learning like all the online platforms and wasn't really working like the first three weeks like we didn't hear anything from our teachers because like all the platforms didn't really work so uh, it was nice for us because uh, we had like coronavirus holidays so yeah. we enjoyed it pretty well but then you come to the point where you know you have your A-fans and it's actually pretty shitty if you don't see your teachers and mm. yeah so that it's like really tough but like uh on Monday we have to go back to school like only our class like we are only 20 people in, in the school uh to so have wow. like a few hours of like preparing for the for the big exams so uh, so your exams are still going ahead yeah so in the UK what they've done I think I'm right here George yeah. is that all the GCSE which is the 16 year old yeah. exams and all the 18 year old exams they're not taking them they're just getting given grades off what their teachers predict yeah there's a lot happening. Yeah, that's same actually that. super awesome because uh, <laughs> first of all you don't have to you. study anymore <laughs> yeah and I knew like that, that the UK is doing that I think also yeah also I I think another like Belgium I think they also did it and I was like why, why don't we do it like I mean we've I've studied for so many years already like why can't we just uh, get the degree and then uh, bye bye never see Things you again all around. <laughs> but I mean it's not that easy no so but it's good. I mean, the last time. You're both eight, you're both eighteen. It was a a long time ago, but I remember being eighteen, and all I wanted to do when I was eighteen was party. I guess that's what all your friends are doing. How do you deal with that? Being, you know, pro athlete. Oh, for me, it's easy because I don't really like to party. All right. Okay. I think I, I learn how to party in World Cups. Yeah. Because before I never <laughs> do that. And uh, and um, yeah, my friends are doing that, but they they know, they know that I don't like that, and I'm not going there because I had to train and woke up early, and you know relax uh, in the night and everything. So yeah, it's not a problem for me. I'm not a party guy. Vale. Ah, oh, come on, T. Well, the first year was a big party year. <laughs> Uh, don't, say, don't say it it's a secret um, nah, it wasn't bad the first year was crazy, like it's, but... it's pretty impressive I think for juniors coming into those World Cup after parties because you see all your big heroes like getting drunk like yeah. super <laughs> funny drunk. <laughs> especially Minar he leads the charge oh uh, yeah <laughs> so the juniors too yeah of course <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, do you do you have any hobbies away from biking? Yeah. Me, yes. I have a few, like moto for sure. I, I yeah. think uh, as all the races, moto and like uh, wake surfing. I yeah, wake boarding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, like a small car, you know, like uh, electric car. A remote like control uh, car. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. Well, did you still ski, obviously? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, still a big part uh, of my life, actually, because I spent a few years racing, skiing, and then, uh, yeah, just, like, going backcountry skiing in the winter is just uh, super prime. Like, it's so good. Yeah. Nice. So, um, Bali Tani said last week that she was super excited to see how you were going to get on in your first year, and I think her words were she was sad she'd be sad to see if your first World Cup season in elite 
um, would be taken away from you because it was a really special time for her. It has to be the most wide open the female category has ever been, for sure. You've got Rachel, as you said, best rider of a generation, recovering from another injury. Injury. Tani with two injuries. She's second twice in the overall and second twice at world champs. Miriam, 2017 overall winner and 2019 world champ. Um, and then you've got Tracy, who's just won the overall last year for the first time. Marine, who's pushed her yeah. very close and is clearly a huge talent. We've got yourself adding into the mix, plus a big group of other riders who really stepped up to the mark last year and filled those spaces. And uh, yeah, it's going to be very competitive. Are you excited to to ju jump up to elite and, and get in the fight? Yeah, it's uh, I can't wait. It's super impressive. And it's also like so cool to see like how good the girls got. Because like the last past years, it was only like Rachel and then yet like second and third who were like swapping. Yeah. And then like fourth and fifth. But now it's like so hard to even like get on the podium. Yeah. And uh, now like everyone is recovering. Everyone has time to really prepare and train. It's going to be intense. Like I think there will never be like a more intense women racing than the next few years. Like, yeah, I can't agree. wait. And the reason I listed all that stuff is for my next question. What, what are your aims going into the season? Well, I think I'm just going to approach it like I did with my first junior year. Like, uh, just trying to be consistent, like learning and uh, trying to adapt as quickly as possible. And yeah, just giving like the best from, from the bottom to the finish line and not like in juniors where you knew like you can chill a bit. You just have to give your very best. And if that's not enough, you have to train more. So. Yeah. Nice. It's a strong attitude. Um, fingers crossed this is not going to happen, but... How annoyed will you be if World Champs on your home track is cancelled? I mean, it's a really big thing to have like Worlds or even like a World Cup in your hometown. Because mm -hmm. like, all your family is there, like like small like newspapers and stuff. Like so many people want something from you. And yeah. it's not like I ride there every day. Because uh, I mean, Liogang is a cool track, but not really good for like training downhill because it's not that technical. So you rather go to Schlapping where you have like oh, really yeah. a lot of yeah routes and big jumps and stuff. So I don't think I have advantage. Uh, maybe I ride the motorway this summer like every day, but <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, not where you can gain a lot of hundreds. Maybe maybe I will go with the skin suit and try different stuff. I don't know. Fibo, <laughs> <laughs> you started 2020 with a crash at the Brioud Cup in early March. What happened and what damage did you do to the knee? Ah, just the posterior ligament mm. that almost broke, like almost just few little, uh, little things they stay yeah. in. Yeah, ligament. So, yeah, ligament. So only for like, um, I don't even crash, only on the right corner, just slide and hurt a, a rock on the side of the track. And uh, yeah, it was so painful. And yeah, a few days later, I just take uh, I just do an X-ray, and it was uh, really bad. So the doctor says that uh, I had uh, four months to to be ready. Yeah. So I check if I had to be um, uh, to have an um, oh surgery. Yes, yeah, surgery. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. To have a surgery or not, but hopefully, uh, like I uh, didn't do it. It was yeah. really good because uh, now it's going really quick and the knee is almost ready. Um, I can move uh, all the knee and I can do like uh, little, little squats. I can pedal and I can do some gym gym workout to to, to get the, the knee stronger and uh, to be on the downhill bike the, the quickest I can. <laughs> when, when, which round were you hoping to come back for? Uh, normally, it was for the fourth round, I think. Right. But um, is that Andorra? If the, it's Fort William. I know. Yeah, I think it was for William was possible. Right. But uh, with how the knee is going, I think I could have done the Maribor race. I think with few risks, but I could have done that. 
yeah. or maybe Lozine, but it's maybe it was too much risk for for mm. first ra- race in elite, you know. Yeah. So I think I, I would have wait more more time. And, and to be how's more how's the knee injury? How has that impacted your aims coming into this season? Um, basically, it has changed nothing to my goals because uh, I always have the same goal. I was really prepared for the season. Yeah. Was feeling good. Um, but uh, with the, the gap we have uh, in the summer, I knew that I could have like uh, trained more and uh, take the, the time I lost during the few months yeah. where I was injured. So yeah, it doesn't change a lot of things. Just that I missed a few races and uh, the experience I could get for the first few rounds, uh, I will not have done have them for the last few rounds. Yeah. But now uh, I don't know. We will see if there is a race this year or not. <laughs> well, it looks like we might have some. As we said at the start, there was talk mm. yesterday. I saw that there might be some racing, so that that would be good. Let's finish with some questions for each of you then. Uh, Let's start with some about racing. Valley, last week, Tani said that she had to really work on her first sector of track. She said that she was always a bit too chilled at the start and had slow first splits. And you said that earlier on tonight as well. Is that the main thing you think that you have to, you had to improve on in 2020? Yeah, I think definitely. Just uh, go flat out like from the top and uh, just trying to give my best and uh, I think it's hard to see because, I mean, I was racing against the juniors and I was always like up at the split, so I never know like where my weakness was. But I think I was really strong at the end, but yeah. you can make up time already on the top and try to, to keep the flow like until the finish. It would be even better. <laughs> Is there any other areas you, you thought you needed to work on? Well, I think it's just Valley's all the whole track <laughs> I need to work on, so... <laughs> That's where you find me. <laughs> <laughs> and Tiba, what about you? Yeah, it's the bottom of the track for sure because I was yeah. lost like one second on the, this part of the track. Yeah. Uh, it's being like uh, all, already two seconds at the first pit. So yeah, the bottom of the track and improve all the tracks in general, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Cool. So... Has your training or your approach for either of you changed knowing you're now going up against the elites rather than facing the juniors? Ellie, I'll let you kick us off. Uh, for me, not really, because I'm still in school. So I have the same amount of time like I had the last two years. Yeah. So actually, like now with the, with the virus and not being in school, like I have all day long time to train. It's really cool because yeah. you can do like one session in the morning, one session in the afternoon and like, also get like the recovery like going into the sauna or like doing ice baths and stuff like that yeah. so it's cool to like try the time out so i know how it is when i'm done with school and be like a pro and yeah. really like do everything and do every day something where now like you're in school until four or five o'clock and then you go into the gym you're super tired mm-hmm. but then you have to go home and like study and stuff so can't wait until I have time and, and try the pro life. <laughs> yeah, a taste of it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. cool. And then I guess, Tibo, you've been working on your knee, but what, were there any plans to change up the way you do your training? Yeah, but this year I have more time because the, the time of school was uh, shorter. Uh, so I have more time to train. Uh, yeah, just do more session, like one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and between, in between, go to school. So yeah, it's uh, really, really benefit. And uh, it's so good. Like uh, you feel that uh, you are stronger on the bike and maybe faster, you don't know <laughs> until the first race, but um, no, it's really good. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to, to do only that uh, in the day. Oh, not only that, because you, you have 24 hours in a day, so yeah, you, uh, you can do more stuff, but uh, it's good. Your main focus, yeah. It's yeah, quite yeah. funny, like, the conversations we've had with people over the last few weeks, um, there seems to be two approaches to the the lockdown or the, the extended off-season, should we call it, and you guys have the same approach as I do in that it's just more time to train and restructure and find better ways to make yourself a better rider. 
and then I won't name anyone, but we've we've been hearing that other riders are just seeing it as a little bit of a holiday, um, time off work, and you do just wonder when we do get given the green light how much it is going to show the guys who've gone right. This is time for us to be super prepared and use all of it for our benefit compared with people who've gone, oh, I'll have a two month holiday and, uh, and chill out. So oh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, do either of you use a sports psychologist towards your, your mental preparation? Is that anything you've done? Yeah, oh. I, I do. Tibo, have you, have you done any kind of stuff like that before? No, no, nothing. Okay. Valley, how important no. do you feel that is towards racing nowadays? It was not really just for racing, like in general, because you talk about your whole life and then uh, trying to balance like school and family and, and your racing career mm-hmm. and, uh, and sponsors and stuff. Because I think it comes really, it hits you pretty, pretty hard from like, racing youth and then you're junior and you get so much like exposure from 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 social media and sponsors and so many people like start talking to you yeah. you can't really prepare for that and yeah. it just hits you and then but you're st- still in school like have a normal like youngster life and stuff so uh, it's it helped me to balance stuff and like really separate like racing from school and like my normal life thing going out with friends and stuff so nice. it was a big help yeah it- did you find it hard to say no to things? Oh yeah, at the beginning, yeah. yeah. And it was it was tough because of course, like you're super stoked when people want something from you or like say, oh, let's do an interview and stuff. But like, if it's like before your race run or stuff like that, or like distracting you from concentrating on the race, or you had a bad bad training day or bad qualifier, and then people want to start, yeah, want to talk to you all the time. It's it's hard to say no because if you say no, people say ah, oh, like she's pissed off and she's arrogant because she's not talking to me and stuff. So it's 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 good to have someone who tells you that you can say no and it's not because you you're arrogant. Yeah, yeah, just because you've not got time. Yeah, did you um did you find that it it helped with race day preparation, dealing with nerves and things like that? Yeah, I think you have a lot of people who can help you, like even if it's the physio stuff, like uh like I I was working with the body mechanic, uh, which helped me a lot because he had like some breathing techniques and stuff just to calm you down or I think even the, the night before your race run, like you can't get to sleep and stuff. So it helps you like just breathing and really like trying to calm down. So yeah. it's good. Yeah, I agree. I I was lucky enough to get put with a sports psychologist when I was at uni um, and you're dead right. The work I did with him wasn't just helpful for racing, but it's also so helpful for just day to day things. And yeah. Tebow, do you, do you ever think that's sports psychology is anything you will want to utilize in your career or is it not something you've ever thought about? Uh, for the moment, I don't like to, to talk to people, to someone that I don't know, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I relate to that. For the moment, it's my dad who is doing that. Like when I'm not good, you say, "Hey, come on," you know, <laughs> like, uh, "Hey," or my even my mother, maybe more. Or my sister, <laughs> it's the same. Just the, for me, the family is okay for that. Uh, for the moment, I don't, I don't need it. I don't know if I need it, but I don't feel that I need it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's hard to me to to maybe to to speak yeah. to someone. Uh, so yeah it's kind of real for the moment uh, yeah no, I think for a lot of people sports psychology is one of those things that one while you feel good you don't feel like you need it and then two yeah. until you've tried it you don't know whether whether it's helpful or not yeah. um, so who, yeah. who do you guys have helping with your your kind of race craft you just mentioned your your dad there um, who, who kind of helps you with your your race preparation and your 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 kind of strategy with racing. Yeah, for sure. My dad has been there all the time. When I was racing BMX, it just take me to the races, like uh, in Belgium for BMX, in uh, like uh, all around Europe. So it take it took a lot of time from uh, from his work to for me, and uh, even youth category too for downhill, even if it was more in French. 
in yeah. France. And uh, now that, uh, and he was like kind of my mechanic in the youth category. So it was really stressful for him <laughs> because, uh, yeah, you don't want to have a mechanical uh, or something happen on the bike uh, from your dad, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. So now he's really chill. Just uh, he's coming to like almost every races to, to see me and uh, to see the elites and everybody races because he loves the sport. And uh, it's good to me to have my family on the on the race to I know to relax and yeah I like to have my family on the race. Nice. And Valley, does your dad still come to the events and uh, get involved? Yeah, so it's the same. Like my dad always dr drove me to the races and was it was the driver, was the the chef, was the mechanic. So uh, yeah, I'm, I think we are super lucky to have like parents who support one and. Even like even if you're in a big team, they still come and like celebrate with you and watch you. And it's just good to know that they're here, even though you don't really need them anymore. But yeah. it's good after the race that you can yeah. go to them. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So you both dominated your categories, as we've said. Um, but apart from maybe Crankworks Valley, you've never been on the live feed, certainly at the World Cups. How excited are you both for that day you qualify in the, in the live feed and get to race in front of the world? Like, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it happens, you know, if I'm top twenty, uh, yeah. like, it will be amazing. Yeah. More visibility and just great to see you run one more time after yeah. you know or many times. You yeah. can see your mistakes or maybe your good lines. You don't know, but uh, I think yeah. it's really too. It's not yeah. just great to see riding, but great to to learn and to to study your riding approach. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things about it afterwards, being able to have a look at, at your run. Um, and then also before, there's something about knowing that all your friends and family are going to be watching, as opposed to if you've qualified 25th or whatever, and you know you're not going to be on the, on the live. Whereas if you're going to be on TV and your, your mates at home are going to be watching with a beer, it just fires you up that little bit more. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that live timing, like what my parents do when they can't come or fly over to the races, like just waiting until the split time, like like you go for the split time. That must be terrible because you can't see us. Like you're just waiting for the splits to come and then you go to the finish. That must be terrible. I think those minutes must be terribly long for my family. Yeah, I think my mum still has a heart attack every time she waits for my next split to come up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny. Uh, it's all right. Um, do you guys do you guys know if you'll in like, be in Group B practice at your first Elite World Cup, or do you do you know that yet or not? Yeah, I think I will not because I'm you know UCI points. points. Yeah, yeah, I'm top twenty. I yeah. think. Yeah, oh, twenty nice. between twenty and twenty five. So oh. I don't think so. I hope so. I hope no. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Valley? Do you think your ranking is? No, I think I'm I'm B practice, but I can do the the uh, time training because I'm junior world champion. So if nice. you go into elite, like junior world champions can, yeah, and to they can fair, go to time practice. If you that's can cool. get the time practice, then that's super valuable. So yeah, Let, let's finish with a little bit of chat about your race bikes. You were both on 29ers last season. Did you have to adapt your riding style for the for the bigger wheels at all? You go first, Tibo. Yeah, I uh, for myself, it's been kind of weird because I love the 29 first. Yeah. But then during the two years I rode, I ride it, it just like changed my position on the bike and it was not great because I was so tight and yeah, nothing good. And this winter we moved to the 27 on the back and I just have a new life on the really? bike. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, for sure. So you were planning on racing like a mullet for the se this season. For the, I think the yeah. whole team is, is it? Yeah, yeah, the whole team is going on the mullet and it's so great. You know, it's, I think it's faster. Even if it's not faster, it's just funnier and you feel better on the bike. Yeah. Um, just more natural. And you don't have this big wheel outing your ass every time. Yeah. <laughs> and you can like, even on the jumps, you are like, uh, it's more funny, easier. Yeah, and you can push more and be more in control with the bike. So, yeah, to me, it's a big evolution. Ah. 
Vale. Yeah, I was racing the first 20 year with the 27 and a half. And then yeah. uh, in the off season, we swapped to the 29er, uh, which was funny actually, because when we got the testing frame, like I got sick and I was in France, so I couldn't ride because I was like throwing up all the time. <laughs> so Matt, my mechanic, which is like nearly the same size as me, like was testing the bike and he was like, okay, you, you can ride there. So I haven't touched the bike at all. And he ordered all the parts. And I was just trusting him <laughs> that I can ride that bike. So I was thinking, Vali, that was dumb. Like, you're so stupid. Why would you trust him? Like, you never touched the bike. But when I rode it, like, I was super stoked. It was just so much safer and you felt m more, like, stabilized and stuff. Yeah. So uh, I was getting on with it really well, even though I'm not that tall. So, uh, yeah, stoked. But I hit my bum all the time, so... We, 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 you, would you have been on a full 29er? Well, are you going to be on a full 29er this season? Yeah, we tried the mallet, but it's not working with the frame. I think they have to do like a different link it, yeah, in the rear. So uh, this year we go with 29er. Cool. So aside from wheel size, have either of you kind of changed your setup much from when you started racing World Cups to now? Or is the main thing that you've tried the wheel size? No, I change. Uh, I I try quite a lot of things, you know. So this year I'm more coming back to the basic that I was the first year, maybe like more stable, like uh, less uh, like stiff bike. Okay. Because the last year my bike was really dynamic and really stiff. Right. So yeah, this year I'm more like soft and yeah. more a bit more grippy. Yeah. Uh, well, we went a bit stiffer, like with my setup, because uh, I just got stronger. Like, yeah. I just developed a lot the last two years. So uh, you can't compare my setup from the first year to now. Yeah, you'd struggle to ride your the bike that you were riding at the first race in 2018 if you rode it today. <laughs> <laughs> nah, for sure. Like, yeah. No, nah, it's cool. It's cool to see the progress, like yeah. what you gain when you train and stuff. Absolutely. And you've been with YT since you were 13, is that right? Yeah. So have you have you ever ridden any other bikes, really? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that one <there. laughs> Was that just out of kind of curiosity? Who knows? Yeah. No, I'm pretty stoked with YT. Like, <laughs> like to have that partnership for so long, because, I mean, it was like a six-year contract when I signed it. Oh, my yeah. parents signed it for me. So yeah. I didn't even know if I'm going to like do World Cups or like keep racing. And to have the possibility with, with this RAM team to get YT into that team uh, yeah. is pretty sick. So I'm pretty happy that everything worked out. Yeah. Cool. So the, the, the common cell you were going to be, well, you're going to be riding Tiba. Um, is yeah. that a completely new frame, a new design, or is it the same one that kind of Jack's riding? But with a different link on the millet yeah is it um i don't you know it's not a completely new bike just like uh adapt for the 27 back right okay so uh, but the linkage i think it's a bit different the the the, the size of the back yeah and i think some little points as they hang the front hanger angle yeah. but it's still got uh, the high pivot and the yeah, yeah, but the high pivot is a bit lower, I think. Okay. They're just like, you just adapt for the, Ref for the mud. Refining it yeah. every year. Yeah. Cool. Well, look, best, best of luck to you both when we do eventually go racing. And, and thank you very much for, for coming on the show. I have a terrible memory, so I particularly enjoyed this episode because I can genuinely remember all the races that we've talked about. <laughs> Anything beyond about two years and I start struggling, so... It's been really enjoyable to do this one. Where's the best place for people to kind of keep track of your of your progress? Is it Instagram? Yeah. 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 And it's at Valley Hall and at yeah. Thibaut de Prella. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Jack? Easy. Yeah, I'm just the same. Nothing's changed. It's got the Instagram there and then uh, the Mountain Bike Live series on YouTube. So if you're bored, that's what's going on. Cool. <laughs> I'm watching it. <laughs> Have you seen it? Yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah, sure. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're at Making Up The Numbers Racing. 
thanks very much to our sponsors for the podcast, Hope Technology, Revolution Bike Park, Schwalb and SingletrapWorld.com. I'd just like to end with a couple of quick thank yous. Firstly, we'd just like to thank everybody from, for the messages we've received over the last few weeks from people all around the world saying how much you're enjoying the show. It was never in the plan for us to put an episode out every week this season, but once the lockdown started, we thought it would, would be a good opportunity to give everyone who loves racing a bit of a downhill fix every weekend. And it's great to hear that the show's helping you kind of get through these difficult times. And secondly, I'd, just a quick thank you from me to Neil White. Whilst Jack and I have our own questions Obviously, for all the guests we have on the show, Neil's busy working away in the background researching for us and submitting questions of his own. And I just wanted to say thank you to him for all his hard work and patience, particularly when it comes to explaining fork offset. I won't ask again, I promise. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Thanks very much for listening.